Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you for joining us. We are here at the 2022 USA Climbing Paraclimbing National Championship. I'm here in the booth with Denny Kauska and Andrew Chow, two very influential people in the paraclimbing world. Good morning to the, to the two of you. How are you? Hello, thank you for having us. Doing pretty good, man. Doing pretty good. Excited to see what our competitors come up with today. Excellent, we are about to start this thing up. Our first two climbers are about to join us on the wall, so y'all at home sit tight and we will be in the action in a moment. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're back in. Sorry about that. We had a few technical difficulties. Had to make sure that our audio is not pushing through the in to the in-house audience and only to you at home at the live stream. So again, we're here with Andrew Chow and Denny Kauska, both influential 
experienced in the paraclimbing world. Um, I want to start with you, Andrew, and I'm told that you are one of the forefathers of USA Climbing um, and that you do work, I'm not sure how to say, is it prosthetist? I, I, so, I guess, ooh, I'm still pushing the house. For our viewers at home, stand by just for another moment. We're going to work this out and make sure that our audio is not continuing to push to the house. Um, so we're going to put the interview on hold, and I will continue to, uh, well, you know what? We're just going to trade this mic back and forth. Andrew, you can go ahead and turn that one off, and I'm going to hand you this one, and uh, that's just how we're going to run it. That's how we do it here. Here you go. Thanks, man. Um, yeah, I guess you can call me one of the, the forefathers if you want. I, um, I was part of the original adaptive climbing um, committee for USA Climbing, so I had the, the honor of working with a number of really uh, good folks at the beginning to help start launch this program and host our initial competitions in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, I don't know, was it eight, nine competitions ago. Um, and I've been a part of the community for a little longer. I started um, first volunteering with uh, a program in New Jersey called Peak Potential, and they were running since about 2000, doing programming for kids with physical disabilities there. Um, got a chance to help Karima launch ACG when they started in 2012, and be a big part of a number of other organizations like Catalyst and Paradox. And now I'm one of the primary organizers for the Adaptive Climbers Festival, which we'll be having our uh, third festival uh, this fall in, in the Red River Gorge. So um, uh, as just on the side, I work with uh, another one of our, I guess, forefathers, Ronnie Dixon, and he and I want to practice in Tennessee, or prosthetics practice there. Um, where we get to really help a lot of really good folks and some of our friends and uh, I guess patients, I guess, are our athletes here today. Cool. Th thanks so much for the background. I had the pleasure of working with Ronnie last year, uh, and so it's good to have you um, with us as well and you do, the, do that sort of work with him. Uh, our other guest here today, again, Denny Kauska. And Denny, you are an, a seasoned competitor yourself. Uh, it's... I've got some notes here that you have competed in the Paraclimbing World Cup or uh, World Championships in Moscow and the Para World Cup in LA. Oh, we got some sound in the house, ladies and gentlemen. It looks like our first two competitors are about to join us on the floor. It's going to be Ben Hickson and Colin Torpy with AL1 and AL2 kicking things off for us. I'm going to do another quick mic check on another mic and see if we are where we want to be. Let's see. How's it work? Okay. It looks like we're okay. Our other mic is out of the house, so I'm going to pass this over. Awesome. So in AL2, we have Colin Torpy. Colin is uh, out of Atlanta, Georgia, or Kennesaw. He's been climbing for a long time. Started Actually, he's one of only two competitors in our field that has been at every single Adaptive Nationals. We started off at our first one in Atlanta and uh, hasn't missed one yet. You see he's wearing our uh, traveling pineapple pants here. These guys have had quite a journey. They started with a pretty proficient climber, Chad Jukes, and um, followed the way to out to Maureen Beck and then Ronnie Dixon and uh, then uh, Emily Stevenson and now Colin. Over on AL1, we've got uh, Benjamin Hickson. Benjamin's been climbing for uh, two years as a paraclimber. He climbed before his, his uh, spinal cord injury as uh, apparently a bike accident. Um, he just loves getting out there on the wall, and wow, he's <laughs> seen some hard stuff through. These boys off to a strong start here. Colin Torby making quick work on the left side. Ben looking to find the beta for the way through, find that power he needs to get on top of these next two volumes. Taking a quick rest, it looks like. Come on, man. So for our AL2 climbers, they are climbers without uh, use of their their legs, so they're just got a campus up the wall, and that's that's we all know how hard that is. But um, he's off the wall. Sometimes, as us, those with spinal cord injuries, they also have additional uh, kind of deficits in, say, abdominal muscles. So, like, if you can imagine trying to campus without the use of 
of abdominal muscles, it would it was just, it's pretty hard. Yeah, of course. I hadn't, like, canvassing is not just your arms. It looks like it is. But if you think about it a little harder, obviously there's a ton of core involved. And Colin, absolutely on fire here. Channeling some good form. Colin's been uh, it's a pretty seasoned competitor. He's he represented the U.S. on the international level. And, and a couple years ago, he was actually the U.S. national champion. Well, he's certainly showing his capability today as an ex-national champion. Looking for that top right now. Still looking pretty confident, about three quarters up the route. Colin taking quick advantage of that rest before he makes it up this final head wall. Oh. Short hesitation there. Colin Torpy is down. Sucks. But an excellent attempt for Colin. Back in the action again, joining us now is Corey Ramos and Jorge Macias. Denny, do you know these competitors? Yeah, so Jorge is one of our paraclimbers from the uh, PCH, the Bay Area, and he's been climbing for four years, but our our chapter didn't open till last year, and in that last year, he's really been able to focus on his climbing, um, and that's what brought him here. This is his second time competing at Paranationals. Um, and he, his favorite thing about climbing is the physical and mental challenge of it. All right, well, we are excited to see what he can do here. Um, you said it's, his, it's only his second uh, paraclimbing nationals. How many years has the paraclimbing nationals been running now? Um, as mentioned with Colin, um, it's been eight years. It's, it's our, well, it's, I mean, it depends on how you count the years because we had the year of a break during COVID, but um, there's been eight competitions. I see. So on AL2, we have Corey Ramos. Corey is also one of our, our really long-time competitors. He spent a little time away and with uh, just starting, to, starting his family, but he, uh, he's been a, a pretty, very proficient climber for us, and you know, he's one of the, the two athletes, in addition to Ronnie Dixon, who actually competed in um, bouldering, able-bodied bouldering national championships a few years back in Wisconsin. Okay. Um, he he's competed in uh, cycle block um, out in uh, cycle block out in, in Utah a couple years ago. So he's he's been around. Um, right, experienced and quite capable. It sounds yeah, like. Yeah, a stellar climber outdoors as well. So and he's been doing this. I want to say 11 years now. He started when he was in his late teens, I believe, and um, it's been a, a big part of our growth as as a community through the years. Jorge here shaking out, looking to get it back. Struggling to get to the same part, getting those next two volumes. Seems to be sort of the first crux of the route. And here on camera now, Corey Ramos. Looking so confident. Oh. And great effort from Jorge. Good job. Great second year. Corey pulling to that steep section now.
Corey looking to take advantage of that rest as well before tackling this head wall. He's had enough, decides to keep on going. Had a little discussion with Corey before a competition. He hasn't been climbing too much on rope. Kind of the first uh, recently, just been busy with life. So he's... The excellent attempt by Corey Ramos. Maybe the route seems point. to pick up a little bit there. It's close. Maybe could have been a new high point. Can't be sure. Very close. For the seated climber, we have Avni. He's been he's been with PCH uh, since the start and and has been climbing for five years. Um, he's from New York City and climbs uh, a lot at the Cliffs LIC and also Brooklyn Boulders. Um, he is a fantastic campus climber um, and just one of the most like built climbers that we've ever seen. Um, he has recently gotten into lead climbing and mock uh, ice climbing at the gym. Um, and then also at, at the Cliffs LIC, there is a, a slack line much above, like above the entire gym, and there's a ladder to it, and he started campusing that ladder. And it's really epic to watch on it. Uh, and you can see some videos of him climbing at the gym on our Instagram, Paracliff Hangers. So cool. Excited to see what he can do here. He's off to a quick start. Avni yeah. now at that first crux, Avni manages to find his way through. So strong. Looking fiercely determined here. Avni bringing all that aggression here. Yeah. On AL2, we have Jake. Jake's just kind of slowly working his way through. Another seasoned competitor with, you know, experience both on the national and international level. Uh, I think he represented the U.S. last last year in the World Cup and came away with the silver medal at, in L.A. Um, he actually resides out in L.A. where he's a, a route setter and a coach at Rock Creation. Um, he does a lot of work with Evolve in, in just testing their their feet and prostheses out there, and super, super psyched guy. Um, now living on a sailboat with the service dog, Moxie. That's wow. pretty cool. I've had the pleasure of knowing Jake for um, a little while since um, the Pan Am is where I met Jake, and, and, and absolutely stoked individual, great guy to hang out with. I'm always happy to see him at these events, and I'm happy to see him here. Uh, and I'm rooting for him as he makes his way, approaches this head wall. <laughs> Certainly having a good time with it. Yeah, sounds like it. All right. Jake looking for the high point now. Yeah, it's, I think that's right where Corey was as well. Similar beta. Oh! <laughs> and another, all smiles still for Jake. Always. Always having a good time. Another excellent effort. Jake Sanchez. Ready? We have our next two out on AL2. We've got Kyle Long on the left side. On the right side, it'll be Carlos Quiles in AL1. So Carlos is at just an absolute pressure. He's been coming to nationals for, for many years. He's competed at the World Cups and the World Championships. And, and um, he's, uh, he's definitely the person to beat. Um, this is his fourth uh, nationals. Um, 
he mentioned uh, he, he was happy to disclose about his disability a little bit, and he has a spinal cord injury from uh, since he's been two years old. Um, so he's gone through his whole life with this, and it's come with some, uh, you know, added strengths by being able to just learn to adapt. Of course. I'm excited to see him put it to use here. Hopefully we can see a top. And you said he's the one to beat. He's the, he's, he's the one to beat, absolutely. And um, he definitely, his favorite part of climbing, even though, even though he's such a serious competitor, is community. Um, and he's coming from uh, CRG in Connecticut. I, I think the climbing world in particular is cool. The community aspect of it. Man, in many sports, maybe once you get done high school, once you get done college, you don't really have an opportunity to be part of the community that you once loved so much. Yeah. Um, and in the climbing world, that goes as long as you want it to go. So I, I sh certainly share that sentiment that that is uh, a, an important and unique part of climbing that before, I love. Before competitive climbing, he actually was very active in, adaptive, in other adaptive sports, including wheelchair basketball um, and track and field. Um, but he prefers climbing. Um, it gives him uh, it, it gives him more access with less adaptive equipment uh, required, and so it, it really is a testament to the sport as an adaptive sport. Um. Well, he's off. Here we have Kyle Long. Kyle looking strong through that first section. Kyle's uh, Kyle's a amputee out of. Um, Durham, North Carolina, where he's a uh, surgical, or surgical nurse, an aura nurse, um, for uh, a children's children's hospital, I believe. He, he started climbing with uh, Duke, Duke Adaptive, in North Carolina. Um, he's, he's a great, great climber. Here we have Carlos continuing to make headway here. Fighting for that right hand, gains it. One of the skills that's so difficult to learn in campus climbing is the ability to learn how to rest. And Carlos, from being a seasoned athlete, is able to find time to kind of rest and then push forward. And you, we just saw that right there. Yeah, and learning to use sideways momentum to, to get to next holds as a seated climber, certainly a skill set that, that he's got. Kyle getting pretty high up on the wall there. Yeah, so certainly the high point here. The resting in particular in the AL2 is impressive in that you always, always hanging and they become so conditioned and so strong to be able to rest in that position. Yeah. Rooting for him here as he tries to gain this right hand. We got a whole crowd behind him in the house right now. Nice. Kyle's on that same spot that Corey got to and that Jake got to. Looking for that right hand here. Oh. <laughs> Kyle Long fighting for it, but does not find it. Another excellent effort by both of our competitors. Denny, while we wait for our next two competitors, I'd love to ask you more about your experience uh, competing, particularly on the, the world circuit, uh, the World Championship in Moscow and the Para World Cup in LA. Uh, you're a boss. That's what I'm hearing. I'm sorry? You're a boss. I, well, I mean, I'm not a boss at climbing. Um, I, I have had the honor of been, being part of this community, both at Para Nationals and at the Power World Cup last year in uh, LA and also uh, 
in the World Cup, uh, World Championships in Moscow. But in the only boss ten, uh, tense that could be used is uh, I run the organization Para Cliffhangers, and I was co I'm a co-founder as well as Emily Seelenfreud, and and we together started the organization as two female para climbers that really found that climbing has altered our lives um, in a very positive way, in a very permanent way, and we wanted to make that accessible for a lot of other people with disabilities. That makes you a boss, like yeah. I said. <laughs> now joining us here, we've got Carly Cook, women's AL1, alongside Ethan Zills, men's AL2. Nice. And Carly's been around for competing in this event for many years, and she's I mean, you'll see once she climbs, she's awesome to watch. She's a great, great climber. Ethan, on the other hand, is is our our dark horse, our our newer climber here. He's this is his very first para nationals, um, and he's he's shown out. I mean, he's coming into this competition. I was chatting with Ronnie a little bit about our competitors, right? Um, since he wasn't going to be here this year, and he said, he's, "Watch out for Ethan. He's he's your dark horse." Looking and, to make a splash here. Yeah, he came in qualified first. Um, it really showed some of that bouldering strength. He's he's prefers to boulder, and he's he's uh, some channeling that power. He's just great body awareness as a climber. Well, Carly here is found a sit down rest. I don't think any of the guys found that. Yeah, Carly off camera right now. Just getting started on the route, and has found a fantastic rest on one of the volumes in the house here. But here on camera, we've got Ethan making his way up. He's about halfway, putting that bouldering strength to use. Would love to get the shot of Carly's Carly really on the right side, making her way through. She's really powering through. You can see her experience of five years of climbing. Um, sorry that your eyes are all missing it, but uh, she's definitely reached um, higher than some of the male AL1 competitors. Um, and she is just absolutely crushing it. Um, some fun facts about her is that she has an iguana named Sadie. Um, and her favorite aspects of climbing is the very supportive climbing community. It's a uh, when we were asking some of our competitors what are their favorite aspects of climbing, they uh, routinely mentioned community, and it, and it really it really shows. Um... Carly's still at it, but right now Ethan on the left side. I think that's new high point. I think gains that right hand that everyone's been looking for. After a huge fight, Carly is down, but Ethan is still in that fight. Gaining one hold after another as he approaches the top here on this head wall. Nice. Great foot switch on that prosthesis. Ethan fighting through. It looked like the fatigue set in. An excellent, excellent go by Ethan Zills. Dark horse indeed. That's exactly the splash we're looking for. And if I am reading my chart, Ethan, he, so he came into finals qualified in first place, like you mentioned. That's our last competitor in uh, men's AL2. And just like you would hope for, putting on a show. Absolutely. Making that high point. Now, Mariah is currently in, uh, in school down in Texas at Baylor Medical College. She's studying to be, she's doing her doctorate to be a cancer researcher. Um, so, hasn't been climbing much. Well, it's always exciting. You see, you see someone here competing at nationals who cares, who cares to train and compete and show up, and then you find out, oh, they're also studying to get a doctorate. Um, so, yeah. She's it's hard enough to do one of those things. Absolutely. I mean... And she's relatively new to um, paraclimbing nationals. Uh, so this is her second paraclimbing nationals. Her first one was in Ohio three, two years ago, three years ago, because um, that's before COVID. 
she was in school then too, and she kind of just flew in real quickly, landed pretty much right before the competition, breezed through the rounds, came out first, and turned around and went back home to keep studying. Some people, they got that drive. They got that hustle, they got that drive, and it's clear when you watch them climb and you watch them do the things they do and how much they can pack into a busy schedule. I can't say that I'm necessarily one of them, but I certainly admire the people who, who have that, that ambition and drive to, uh, to be at a top level uh, you know, in, in their career and their academics and obviously here in sport as well. Mariah off to a great start here. Mariah is our first competitor of four that will be competing in women's AL2. So excited to see how she handles this route. Her favorite aspect of paraclimbing is the ability to problem solve um, and develop yourself as an individual in climbing and climb very differently than everyone else. So we can see that being demonstrated in the unique ways that she rests on the wall. Yeah, Mariah is probably one of our shorter competitors too. I don't know that she, she's more than five feet tall. <laughs> so watching her do some of these moves and qualifications yesterday, she had a pretty hard time with some of the reaches, but she's always someone who fights and tries to find creative ways to get around things. Yeah, and it's clear here she has no problem moving dynamically when, uh, when the need arises. And, and it's always, they're the obvious things that will make you a competitor, or a strong competitor, like your finger strength, your endurance, your power, but being clever goes such a long way. Reading things well, um, adapting to your own body shape, and whether you're short, whether you're tall, it, whatever you, these competitors know how to use what they have to, to get up, and it's, it's always amazing to watch them do it. Mariah, taking your time here to plan the next move. Looking very comfortable there in that rest. We repeatedly see that it is it is almost as important to, to know how and when to rest as it is to know when to power through and go fast. Um, we really see that there's there's advantages in, in both styles and, and uh, they both have their place. It's a quite a unique sport. Looks like now she's opting to power through until she gets to that next rest. <laughs> and it seems she's standing on a giant volume, but despite that, it does not look like a comfortable position to be in. Looks like she's not gonna rest there and she's gonna continue powering through. Uh, yes, yeah, the wall's really starting to kick back now. Yeah, the you jets. can't tell on camera, the wall is quite steep here, uh, at least 45 degrees overhanging. She looks for that hold on top of the volume, finds the bump. <laughs> Trying to find a way to kind of heal or create a little tension inside of the, the prosthetic foot. An excellent fight by Mariah Berner. Great determination. We'll have three more competitors in the women's AL2. Next out will be Megan Cusack.
So Megan's a climber out of uh, Chicago. She climbs with Team ACG out there, Adaptive Climbing Group. Um, and they have a, a nice, nice contingent coming out of Chicago. Uh, been a great program there for a few years. Um, you notice that all of our previous competitors today on the AL category have been below knee amputees. See, Megan here is, I believe she's in above knee. And it looks like she's climbing with um, kind of just a short, short attachment as opposed to a full knee, um, knee attachment. So if you've seen Ronnie climb previously, he's got kind of like a, a knee that that uh, has a spring in it. It kind of absorbs force if it falls, but it really doesn't flex at all. Uh, but it gives him a longer lever to push down on. She's got that prosthetic foot um, just pretty much right underneath her socket on a very short pylon. Um, kind of a very different style it, than what so, we see. So that being a strategic choice based on what's going to work best for the terrain that you're in. Yeah, yeah maybe just how she likes to move uh, personally. Like a lot of um, a lot of the AKs, above knee amputees, kind of have different movement patterns that they like to like to try to, to work with. Like some of the international competitors will climb without a prosthesis at all, um, which is interesting. Most of the guys in the U.S. tend to climb with a prosthetic foot, um, and it kind of alternates between either having a full long pylon knee setup, like we see with Ronnie, or uh, someone just attaching directly to the residual limb to the socket. So they kind of have a closer um, feel for where that is in space. Or I haven't talked with Megan to see why she's made that choice on her end, but um, there's a, just a slight difference, I guess, in what she likes to use. Right. Well, I'm excited to see what she can do here. Making quick work at the beginning. Off to a strong start. I would love to see one of these ladies break the current high point, but we will have to wait and see. Megan taking her time to work out these sequences here. Still looking so confident. Looks like she's gearing up to gain that finds it in matches and continues to make her way up. Finding that same rest as Mariah and taking that time to compose. For a moment, I thought she was going to blast right past it, but it seems like the spot. Yeah, yeah you can see, so like with the, the prosthetic foot right there, she can get onto that foothold, that purple foothold there. Whereas if she had like a long pylon, you know, she doesn't have a knee to bend, so she wouldn't be able to use that to can kind of put pressure into that position from the right. Right. I appreciate the insight, and you mentioned it, and the, the difference is easy to see where in cer certain cases, the shorter prosthesis could be uh, quite helpful in certain positions. Yeah. We're seeing a lot of competitors use the evolved climbing foot. Andrew, do you have anything to, to comment or add about the evolved climbing foot? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, it's kind of like the standard, I think, climbing foot for, for most of our competitors. You know, Evolve spent um, a lot of effort working with the community to, to develop um, the shoe for that uh, and to put that foot out. Uh, another company, awesome effort. Another company, TRS, initially uh, helped create the design for that foot um, and then Evolve stepped in to help provide that foot at a much 
lower cost than standard prosthetic components. Right? A lot of times, um, prosthetic components for sports are, are pretty expensive, and, and we're talking thousands of dollars. Um, and Evolve is able to help step in and, and create this foot that competitors can get for just 200 bucks. 200 bucks. Huge yeah. difference. Yeah. From we're talking thousands down to 200. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's been a big game changer for just getting more people into a component that they can use. Next out here, we've got Hannah McFadden. So Hannah um, is coming from uh, in Maryland and, and near Baltimore, and she's been climbing for only nine months. But as we'll soon see, she has a lot of natural ability and, and, and conditioning that was very easily translated from her experience as a para-athlete in track and field. Um, and uh, I'm excited to see, to see how she performs today. It seems fairly consistent that if you grew up competing in other sports, you, you learn things, general coordination, grit, try hard, and, and even if you haven't been climbing for very long, if you've been a competitive person in your life in sports, that, that translates really well. So Hannah was a, a congenital amputee, and um, she's actually not look like she's wearing a prosthetic foot at all on that if she's still, um, still on that congenital side on that on the residual side very proficient in using it yeah absolutely she's moving quick too I'm not entirely sure if it's the same prototype but uh, many months ago I saw her at the gym and we chatted about it and I think it's a it's like a rubber socket she got at Home Depot I believe hashtag yeah, like a no that, that looks like a, a no-hub fitting that you would use in, in plumbing, honestly. It, it looks like a, uh, like a, a rubber cap with a band strapping you know, around the residual limb. And it shows, it shows you know, paraclimbers' ingenuity um, and need to adapt um, in, in every capacity, including in paraclimbing. Um, she felt most comfortable to be able to use her leg uh, 360 and, and so prefers to use... Uh, this setup um, as a way of being able to, to use her leg as, as efficiently as possible. As a congenital amputee, um, she, she wasn't just born with an above the knee amputation. Um, her hip socket is very different. And so it, it does work for her and it works very effectively as we see. Yeah, she's climbing phenomenally well here. Really keeping it an awesome rhythm here, keeping that pace, keeping the speed up to avoid that pump. Now she's in the steepest panel of the wall. Once again, looking at it, it's got to be at least a 45, ang 45 degree angle there looking to gain this right hand and hopefully get a quick rest if she can find it. Big fight from Hannah. Amazing climbing. A little caught up in the rope on the way down, but we're all good. That brings us to our very last competitor in the women's AL2. That's going to be Emily Stevenson taking it home. Now, Emily has been part of our adaptive climbing community um, for a few years now. I think this is her fourth year competing, competing in our, our events. Um, she was a climber before her accident. Um, and I think it was a big part of her recovery to return to climbing afterwards and return to the climbing community. And like we were talking about community earlier, um, just having that support was, was really big for her and, and part of the recovery. And it's 
she's pretty excited every single time she comes out to one of these events because you know, it's just like coming back to your family from around the country. Yeah, of course. It's I, if you have an accident, I imagine the the fear could be that that part of your life may be over, um, and these competitors prove over and over again that that doesn't have to be the case and they're here competing they're out climbing at nationals and i'm sure it feels amazing to to know that you you don't have to let that go and that you can still have it such an important part of your life continues to be that same thing that important element of your life and, and with the people and the friends and in the competition yeah absolutely and she's actually a birmingham native so this is home for her um or at least where her parents are, and right. she's got a lot of network here. But um, she now lives in Huntsville, where she's a teacher. She teaches seventh grade uh, English, so I'm sure that keeps her on her toes, too. I can only imagine. <laughs> Just calm through this first section. Confident. It's interesting to note that although we've had three paraclimbers here that were using, um, you know, a climbing foot prosthesis, you know, each of them are using it very differently to match how their body moves in the most effective way. Um, and Emily's doing a really great job of demonstrating it a different way of kind of trusting her feet, um, which is vital. From this angle, you can kind of see how why all our paraclimbers have been resting around there because right after that is a tremendously overhung roof, um, and so she's just catching her breath and uh, getting ready. So Emily spent a lot of time learning how to use that prosthesis, and you can see, like you know. In that section below, she kind of was able to use the heel hook and learn that uh, technique. It's not something that necessarily comes natural, right? It's not when you and I heel hook, we can flex our foot and engage that heel, like kind of that ball of the heel. And right. That's not, um, you got to learn how to use different muscles to create those tensions when you don't have the ankle joint or if you don't have the knee joint. Yeah, um, looking to create the same effect, but in mm -hmm. an entirely new way. Yeah. So a lot of part of of our athletes' initial journey is not just developing their fitness anymore, but learning new techniques and new movement patterns to, to use that prosthetic foot. Of course. Emily here doing great. Looking super comfortable. Gains what appears to be the last decent rest before the head wall. Gets the quick shake and decides to head on through. Oh, really hoping she can gain this right hand here. Looks Good like she job. lost the foot with the foot slip for a moment, and she's down. Eb Emily Stevenson, it's another great effort that closes out things for women's AL2. So that ends things for the first half of session one. We're going to send our spectators out of the room and do some quick setup. We're going to be jumping back in in a few minutes with men's B1 and men's RP1. So for our viewers at home, sit tight. We're going to change a few things here in this venue, jump right back into the action. We're going to be doing B1, B2, B3 as well as men and women's RP1. So thank you so much for joining us so far, and we will be back with you in a moment.
Just wanted to say hey to everyone back at home. Still here in the booth with Danny Kowska and Andrew Chow. My name is Al Smith. We're holding it down, waiting for the second half of session one to begin. Right now, we've got route preview for B1, 2, and 3, as well as men and women's RP1. And as we're sitting here getting to know each other a little bit, just talking chop, backstories, uh, I started wondering about paraclimbing growing as a sport, the fact that we have a live stream right now, um, and, and, and what you all have seen as far as the growth. And you, you just mentioned that you're seeing a lot of competitors here that you haven't seen before just because you missed one or two years of being at nationals and then you come back and there's more yeah absolutely i mean uh I, I, specifically me I, I haven't been at nationals for a couple of years now i mean obviously we had covid and then last year at salt lake i wasn't able to attend um but and just looking through the competitors as i was walking i was like i don't i don't know these guys and it's a lot of these the, our competitors um and it's just kind of odd because when we first started you know like, i felt like i knew everybody um, yeah, in those first few years, uh, especially in like Atlanta and Kennesaw and then Boston, where I was really involved, I could say. But we only had maybe 40, 50 competitors. Um, I think this year we're, we had 90 competitors. Um, so it's, it's pretty significant. Um, I was actually talking to Karima about it um, earlier in the competition during qualifying rounds. And she mentioned that the live stream she thought was a, a really big help for that. And then she, she feels that she continues to get uh, inquiries from other power athletes. Like we were talking about earlier, this, you know, certain of our competitors had experience in other sports, but were new to climbing. Um, she felt like she was getting a lot of inquiries to her uh, from power athletes that weren't climbers before. And people were just more encouraged to see that, um, that we we have a community here and, and an awesome event. So I, I think the live stream certainly helps. Yeah, that piece of it is so interesting to me, like specifically the live stream. Say you're a young person or at whatever age, you're at home, perhaps you're an amputee, you think that climbing's not in the cards for you and you see on the screen paraclimbing nationals of a, a variety of different competitors killing it on these roots, to, to put it simply. And, and that, that does a lot to, to have that modeled for you and, and to see that on a screen. It absolutely does a lot. And when you do a lot of other adaptive sports, a lot of ad adaptive sports comes with adaptive modifications. And, and we've seen, like, we've seen AL2, both women's and men's, where they have the adult, uh, evolved flip. But at the same time, a lot of our competitors, especially as we go into RP1, we're going to see that their style of climbing is unique, but the gear that is required is the same for every, every single climber. Um, and that is the testament to why I think adaptive climbing needs to grow much, um, much more because it really is an accessible sport, especially financially, because there is not special gear that goes along with it. Um, right. But also, uh, also uh, compared to these other adaptive sports, um, competitive para, uh, track and field, and and wheelchair basketball, we are still very much in our infancy, and we're still, you know ironing out the details and classification systems and, and the rules, but um, it's a little ironic to think that rock climbing is the most accessible. Rock climbing is the most convenient for so many different disabilities, and so, uh, you know, w w one of the things that my organization does is, is trying to actually expand and bring more people into paraclimbing, um, and that means bringing access on many different levels. So yes, this live stream is great. It builds awareness, um, and it makes, makes it easier to talk to all the ground level support that you need to make this better. For instance, you need gym support, you need brand support, you need, you know, you, you need these people to, to, to stand up and be like, oh, parrot climbing is actually really important and it is important to include uh, people with disabilities into the conversation as, as you know, very serious competitive athletes. I, I'd, I'd love to hear more about your organization, Parrot Cliffhangers, here. Obviously, you're at the front of this uh, and bringing a lot to, to the sport. And sure. 
Sure. So we've started in New York City um, uh, when me and Emily were climbers in New York City, and and she moved to California. So now we have a California branch and a New York City branch, and we're very soon expanding into New Jersey and Maryland. Um, and we've gotten a lot of gym support because our our community is very unique in the sense that uh, we we want to create an inclusive and equal community. And so we don't go in just being like we want to create a meetup for people with disabilities. We go in and we were like we want people with disabilities to become part of your community and become part of the general climbing community um, and follow their own goals and follow their own passions um, and be able to experience climbing not as an experience itself but as a lifestyle because this is a lifestyle sport you know it really kind of takes over your your you know not just physically but also emotionally and and, and uh, spiritually you know yeah it certainly does I think we've all experienced that yeah um, and I made a mention about uh, the difference from other sports that certainly take over people's lives when they're young, but then you get out of high school or whatever it is, and you are no longer necessarily like a football fanatic, for instance. Maybe you you watch it a lot, but you don't get to you don't your life doesn't necessarily revolve around playing football yeah. anymore. And, and so many non-professional adult climbers make most of their life decisions based around climbing and that is something that's really special and it's very important to me um, and it's it's cool to hear that you're, you're offering that to the world of paraclimbing as well. I mean to make it a lifestyle uh, especially for paraclimbers uh, you need to approach it both from providing indoor gym access and outdoor climbing access but also you know competitive access and there's a lot of things that come into um, our competitors coming here today and and being able to compete there is not just the emotional toll of going to doctors and filling out forms and going through classifications but also you know all the, all the you know financial um, financial obstacles that might have to be overcome to show up today. Like, yeah, a lot of these competitors have worked day in and day out for for months to be ready physically to be here, but at the same time financially, this is this is a vacation. So imagine imagine wanting to get like when I say vacation, it's the cost of a vacation. So right. imagine having to, you know, work so hard for so many months just because you want to go on a vacation. Like you're choosing climbing over being able to spend that money on something else. Um, um, and so it is so important to have that gym support, have brand support, have support for these paraclimbers so that if they do need some kind of assistance, they do have that um, or to at least acknowledge that, you know, to put that much of your own personal money into competing um, means that, you know, there's a legitimacy in, in that athletic pursuit. It's, it's amazing to hear about and it's I love that you are you're at the forefront of this, bringing the support to the industry and to the people. Um, you talk about it, and it seems obvious that you could you could take the time off work, buy your plane ticket, spend the money, and go hang out on the beach. Yeah. Um, or But you have to make the choice. Do I want to be competing um, in this world, or do I want to use my vacation time to go on a, a let's call it a typical vacation? Um, mm -hmm. So this, the support... And I take it the financial elements, financial support, gyms being involved, brands being involved um, to, to get paraclimbing to a level. Because we know that brands are involved in, in the rest of climbing. Yeah. So to get them involved in paraclimbing as well. Um, so it's I cool. And this is the result is you get more people in it, more mm -hmm. people at nationals mm -hmm. and comp competition happening at a higher level as a result. So one of the ways that, you know, on that ground level, like how do you, how, what does it mean for gym support? You know, like you'll, you'll see a lot of our paraclimbers, um, uh, my, some of our, uh, that are part of my organization, Paracliff Hangers, uh, you'll see that shirt in the back where, you know, like the logo takes up that, but right now you're kind of seeing it on the screen there on the left as Eris is getting ready. And um, one of the ways that our gyms that we associate with, um, are so supportive toward our athletes is if they're competitive athletes, they donate a year membership to them because they understand that training is not something that just takes place for two months or before a competition. It's something that you are doing all year to condition your body to be able to be here. And that a year long membership is quite an expensive obstacle for yeah. some of our paraclimbers. Um, so so we've, we've had a lot of support from the Cliffs LIC, shout out to them, and Touchstone in, in the Bay Area, um, providing that kind of financial assistance to get their paraclimbers ready physically to be here 
it's good to hear when support, like what does it mean? It's kind of broad. Um, and so, you know, I caught myself, I did this. You said support from gyms. And I was like, yes, that's important. And I, I re realistically didn't know what that meant. Yeah. Um, so I'm happy to hear the breakdown on, on what that might exactly look like. Yeah. Um, and that's a great example. And I appreciate the clarification that you can get a year membership. And some of that support just comes even more basically in terms of just knowledge from the gym bases. You know, I've heard stories of athletes who wanted to go, you know, climb, right? And say like this one of one of these athletes was an upper extremity amputee, so he only had one hand, right? And the gym wouldn't let him belay because he only had one hand, and like you know, he had he had residual limb afterwards and things like that, but. Um, and he was fully capable of playing. Like he'd play outside, and, you know. I would let him play me outside, and um, it's not a problem, especially with the Grigory. Uh, but you know, the gym would let him play. Yeah. So he couldn't train. It was hard yeah. to train because he had no partner, and like totally. You know, um, so just having some base knowledge from gyms, uh, just to like, hey, what we can allow these, you know, these athletes, even though they have challenges and differences, um, to get in our gym and use our facilities, and it's safe to do so. And we need our staff to understand how is it safe and in what ways we can maybe learn to train folks who are new coming in to follow these same procedures that are safe. And, you know, that's, that's what having organizations like Paracliff Hangers or Catalyst Sports or Adaptive Climbing Group or Paradox um, who can have programs in these gyms and help gyms learn that, hey, you can make your space a community, you know, that's inclusive to all athletes regardless of what, what's going on. Um, for their, you know, their disabilities. I love it. I, I love the detailed breakdown in-house right now. It's very exciting. We've got Eris Skinderi and... Men's RP1. And Men's RP1. It's Alexander Dornbush uh, having a great time up there. I don't know if you can hear it on the stream. A lot of excitement, a lot of noise, and... Uh, I love it. Uh, so Eris Skanderi is from New York City. He is part of Paracliff Hangers, as we mentioned. And um, he is one of uh, the funniest uh, paraclimbers that you'll, you'll see here today. Um, unfortunately, he's not telling jokes while on the wall. But that is, that is something that all the paraclimbers really love about him, and especially our, our community. Um, typically, when B climbs, um, especially B1, so you'll see that maybe if the camera angle permits, but you'll see that Eris is wearing a blindfold. So B1 is the most visually impaired. Um, and uh, w what's important to understand is that communication is important. So, so he's, he's fighting through, uh, through, through this route and also trying desperately to hear his caller, um, which is Saeed, and, and they're very good friends. And, and the relationship between callers, we'll, we'll talk more about that, um, between a VI climber and a caller is, is very important. Um, and you can see that level of trust even during during these outbursts of noise. Yeah, so in our, our final format here today, like everybody with the exception of the B category is, is uh, I guess, on site. Um, they, they've had no beta, no one can obviously as, uh, no one can screen beta up to them right. while they're climbing. With the visually impaired categories, B1, B2, B3, they have a caller who then obviously can communicate with them as they're climbing the entire time um, and give them instructions about where where holds are and, and how to move to, to and between those holds, right? Um, so and that, that communication and that awareness from a caller of, of how your, your climber climbs and how they like to move and even how to communicate, you know, how far is that hold? You know, what shape is that hold? How are you going to hold that hold? Um, yeah. These are all a very important um, relationship type of, of uh, relation-based communications that come when you have a, a long-term, good working relationship with your caller. And that's a really big component of athlete teams as opposed to just hey, you're out there on the wall by yourself. Yeah, it's a huge difference, and it's something I've uh, I've been thinking about at home. A friend of mine told me that they closed their eyes recently and had someone at the base of the route try to talk them through getting up the route, and it, it did not go well at all. They got into a big fight, um, and 
that communication, I imagine that you would, I would love to talk to someone about this, like personally, what, like do you develop some kind of shorthand or like, a, I, they have to get really good at it, being better at being precise. Um, I, I don't know if y'all know anything about that, but. So um, we, we have a uh, Eris that we just saw with Saeed as his caller, and then we'll see more bee climbers later that um, I can personally speak about their relationship with their callers, and, and so that's how I'm gonna answer your question. Um, they have developed a, a deep and profound friendship. So, you know, I would say that if you took the best bee climbers and you took the best bee callers and you just randomly put them together, they're not going to be able to, to communicate effectively um, on the wall and necessarily like climb at their best. So that relationship, that friendship, the way that you learn to communicate with each other is really what comes uh, to the heart of it. And and really at the end of the day, it's, um, it's, uh, it's a lot of trust. It's a lot of practice um and it's something that you know when we have volunteers come and we ask them to be callers we warn them that the first time you're going to call is going to be some of the worst calling you've ever done in your life and oh. you're going to realize that you're you're you don't understand left from right and and yeah. you don't know how to describe anything that yeah, you're you looking don't know at how far one foot is. you know um and it and you also when you practice it when you close your eyes and you try it you realize that you require so much more strength to be able to to you know hold on and and wait for that information yeah, of course. Great effort from Alex. Big effort by Alex there, having a lot of fun up on the wall as well. Yeah. So normally the comment, the commentating booth would be removed typically, but right now we are in the crowd, um, which is very exciting. I'll give it that. Um, but also a lot of noise sometimes to hear each other over, but we are doing it anyway and having fun with it. Next out is going to be Bill Casson and Connor King. Bill competing in men's B1, Connor in men's RP1. Both of these guys are, are really experienced competitors. I mean, they've been involved with programs for, for a lot, a lot of years. Connor, Connor's been climbing since he was a, a little kid, so he's been climbing for almost 20 years probably. And he actually started competing... Um, out of the Stone Summit gyms, he was, I think he was on Emily Taylor's team out of the Stone Summit gyms, competing in USAC youth um, competitions, not before we even had our adaptive categories built out. And then once we, um, we started running adaptive programming, he, he was part of some of those first competitions, competing as a, in our youth category there. Um, and obviously, um, has continued to climb and really enjoy it as part of his lifestyle. Um, I think he's he's in college now, which is crazy to me. Yeah, um, it makes me feel old. Yeah, of course. Um, uh, there, I feel that as well. More and more over time. Yeah. It's yeah. like it, to me, climbing is not something. If I ever hear, for instance, that someone is like doesn't climb anymore or, or quits, I'm surprised because it's not something that people like tend to walk away from. It becomes a big part of your life, especially if it happens at a young age, um, and. People tend to stay with that for forever. Like there's the friends, the relationships, the traveling lifestyle, the competition lifestyle is such a rich thing that goes so far beyond grabbing holds on a wall. Um, yeah. And so for someone to start when they're young, still be in it, maybe climbing 20 years later, it makes sense to me because I, I feel it. But it's also exciting. I just love hearing it. Like it, it really is a sport that you can sink your teeth into and you just keep it that way, all the way into old age. Yeah, awesome. Um, let's see, Bill over here is is uh, climbing on the B route, B1, and Bill's a, a really long time competitor uh, as well. He, he's represented us, the US, on an international level, again, in world world championships, and um, is a great climber. You can see like how, how deliberate he is in his movement and how like that communication is so key. It's like he's, he'll hold out there and listen to his caller to try to see where's the next hold. Um, Bill, unfortunately, his caller was actually unable to make it to the competition, the one he's been working with for a while. So he's working with a, a caller who, who is very new and who <laughs> they have a very limited relationship. Um, so it's kind of uh, great to see that he's still able to make it here to, 
the finals and still I mean, climb really well. That's Bill there on the left side, the green shirt. Looking quite strong. And it's, a, it's another element that I hadn't considered is that you don't uh, only have to get yourself there, but you would really prefer to have your caller, the one that you're used to working with. And if that can't happen, you still want to go to the competition and you just have to do your best with with a new caller who you may not even know at all. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think they, they only started working together like like two weeks ago or two or three weeks ago. Um, so a lot of new challenges for yeah, Bill. Of course. But we can see how how strong he's still looking up there. Um, Excellent fight there. Connor King on the right side fighting his way through. And Bill Casson still at it here. And you can see his color, I believe, down there in the black black shirt. Right there with him the whole time. Bill setting out into this small traverse here, making his way across these volumes. Oh, nice little rest. With a there. nice rest on the left hip. That is what you want. <clears throat> a quick note on the in-house crowd, though it's not relevant to anyone at home. Um, typically, events like these, they're very loud. A uh, lot of crowd noise, a lot of music, loud MC. It's usually me. Um, but in this case, with the callers doing their work, um, the venue is just quiet so that the climber can focus. And really, I mean, you can imagine a tremendous amount of focus. You're trying to deal with being actively pumped, plan your next move, and listen very closely. Um, so cool to see the support in the crowd. I mean, I say it's quiet. Everyone is very into it. There's definitely energy here. but. It's subdued right now in support of, in this case, Bill as he makes his way up. Bill oh, Casson, yes. ladies and gentlemen. The next out for men's B1 will have Justin Proctor. For men's RP1, it'll be Sonny Yang. Justin is a Boston-based climber, um, originally from Hawaii. Apparently, yeah, it says here that Justin says he can't swim. Yeah. That's the details. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the bio. <laughs> and uh, he's he's in his caller Max. Um, they have a good friendship, and apparently they are on a very very strict diet, training diet this weekend. They eat nothing but barbecue ribs. Yeah, discipline, man. You got to <laughs> do what it takes to win. Oh man, we uh, we did some brief work. Uh, 
Andrew and Denny both know a lot of these competitors. I do not. Uh, before the competition began, we actually we sent them a form. This was this morning. This was being filled out. Um, and trying to gather, you know, the bio, the fun details and facts. Um, so we have them here and there uh, that we'll give you throughout. But uh, some of them were gathered in person. Some of them were gathered on this form that we made this morning. Um, but happy to, to, to be able to offer a little bit of details about our competitors beyond just uh, the performance on the wall. And, and yeah. speaking of, Sonny Yang here on the right is, I, I had the pleasure of knowing Sonny quite a while, although not well. Um, he's an absolute staple in, in the Red River Gorge. Um, and I hear runs a hostel there now. Yeah, you s if they actually zoom in on the shirt, you'd see, I think it's called the Climber's House. Um, and, and Sunny's kind of that exact example we were talking about, like, before climbing being kind of a life a community thing. Uh, I was talking to Sunny earlier, and I was like, how'd you, how'd you end up in the red? Like, just being ridiculous, right? And he's like, he looks, gives me that look. He's like, climbing, obviously. <laughs> you know? Yeah, of um, course. In terms of making, adults making choices, you know, based on, on just climbing. You know, he was... Yeah, I, I don't know if it makes sense to the rest of the world. It certainly makes sense to me. Yeah. But Sunny was was a really proficient climber before his accident, you know, 513D level climber. And he was um, you know, traveling to the red every weekend to, to climb and um, just driving up from, I think he was uh, in the military uh, down at uh, down in Tennessee and driving whenever he had break to go up and climb. And um, then he had his, uh, he started climbing actually, you know, almost 20 years prior to that and, um, in New York City, climbing at Rat Rocks, you know, shout out to those of us in New York locals who kind of know that that area. That vibe, that yeah. old scene. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting scene from a rock climber's perspective, um, but um, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, and then I guess uh, Sonny shared with us that he had a, had a car accident roughly, roughly seven years ago and, um, you know, Still, obviously, that love of climbing has brought him, brought him back to this community and, and to, to back to the Red, where he's still a huge staple. Yeah. Well, he's still, still got that same grit here, fighting his way up this route. And he's been, I, I was actually, I was, I follow him on Instagram. I see a lot of the recovery that he went through and the work that it takes and the pain that you go through. Um, and to, to see someone's attitude determination, optimism, and, and get back on it and be competing at this level now following something like that um, is amazing. Real real athleticism is something to admire. He's up there in the zone trying to take this thing to the top. And though we are quiet, I'm certainly rooting for him. A lot of our paraclimbers, you know, they'll if they've climbed before or even if they haven't climbed before disability um, they all talk about the therapeutic effects that climbing has on their bodies and Sonny when when I interviewed him this morning for for this uh, chat we, we he mentioned that for him climbing saved his life and that he uh, he lives for climbing and and there would be no life if someone took climbing away from him and that that really stands a testament to to what climbing is to so many people in this community and why it's so important to advocate for for accessible climbing well said it's crazy to hear it and I believe it. Excellent fight by Sonny Yang. And that's again, Justin Proctor on the left side. Justin looking strong here, establishing yeah. what I believe is the high point at this time. Yeah. Making his way up these tufas. Looks like he's looking for that volume on the far left and finds it. Yeah. Uh, I don't I don't think you'll be able to hear it on the live stream, but we can hear it here, the instructions that are coming from the caller and they're like like constant 
in, um, just communication between the two and very, very vocal in terms of his, his directions. No, we can't hear the caller in the crowd. I, I may be wrong about this, but there's an earpiece also involved. Yep, yep. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think most, uh, most of the American competitors use an earpiece. Okay. It's, um, Justin fights his way through, but doesn't quite make it. I've seen the Japanese contingent use a Starbucks cup before. Really? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, the, um, Koba and Naoya came to, occasionally they'll come to the U.S. to compete in our competitions um, just to continue to share their knowledge. They are, they are the, the class, world class. Okay. Um, and, um, yeah, they've been in our competitions and not had anything and just take a cup and just start yelling in the middle of the noise, and it's, it's an impressive thing to watch their communication. Season competitors. Yeah. Say your battery runs out in your earpiece, we're not out of the game. It's You're like, we just came here to compete, so give me the Starbucks cup, cut the bottom off of it, and let's go. Yep. Yeah. But, um, gotta do what you gotta do. Yeah, <laughs> sure enough. Next out, we've got Justin Salas. That's men's B2. Moving yeah. on to B2 now. And then on the right side, it'll be Elliot Nguyen, men's RP1. Justin, another very, very seasoned competitor, and he's he's a very strong climber in both the, the bouldering and, and and the rope climbing world. I mean, I think he's he's a double digit boulderer, um, and his he and his caller Matt have been friends for a really long time. Um, and Justin's represented the U.S. both um, on the international level, and, and he's got a good collection of medals along with that. Yeah, I think I remember Justin from uh, last year's Paraclimbing yeah. National Championships. And yeah. There's a few. There's a few competitors here that are really exciting to watch and really strong. Now you have Elliot Wynn on the right. Um, he just started climbing. And, and a little bit about him, he's been climbing for eight years. Um, he also is wearing a PCH shirt. He's He's joined us in the Bay Area at Touchstone and has even become a board member of our of our organization. Um, since we are para run, we, we do believe in having um, a certain percentage of our board members to be para athletes so that we represent the voice. Um, and uh, a little bit about his category and his disability. He uh, he has an upper motor neuron disorder. Um, it's congenital, and it started in his adolescence. Um, and it causes, you know, sometimes in RP1, um, or in RP in general, it's hard to understand or, or under uh, notice the disability or see what's actually going on. But um, what he experiences on the wall is, is difficulty with coordination and, and muscle spasms. And so you'll see he takes a little bit more time to climb um, and uh, really watches his footwork uh, to make sure that he's on properly. Um, and even with that, he is a very experienced trad climber um, and leads uh, leads some 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 makeshift like climbing groups to, to the crag to, to take some of his friendly paraclimbers out. And, uh, um, and when he's not climbing, which is almost never, but when he's not climbing, he leads a scout troop for uh, disabled scouts um, and uh, scuba dives for marine cons conservation. So really just all around um, really fantastic person. Love to hear that he's involved in the scouts. I was a scout at one point in my life, so much love for the scouts as well. Um. Both our climbers here methodically making their way up. Justin just hanging out up there, just shaking out, no problem. So strong. And he's had enough of the rest, makes his way up this series of tufas. And we'll notice Justin's not wearing a blindfold. In the B2 and B3 categories, we do not, um, do not have blindfold because they have partial vision. So um, the reason that I think part of the reason that B1 has one because B1 competitors have no vision and that's kind of like a 
an additional measure in case folks are not exactly truthful about their medical conditions, even though we do a pretty good medical check and, and the like here. Um, but it's kind of one of those IFFC rules that has been ported over, I believe, to us. B1, yeah, well, classifications are, are quite strict and, and quite severe, but when it comes to B1, um, I believe the blindfold also has something to do with, like, you know, there may be absolutely no visual acuity, but uh, they want to make sure that even light or shadow isn't getting through so that one competitor doesn't have an advantage over another competitor in B1, while in B2 and B3, you're going to see more of a gradient where their their di different visual acuities will... will you know, it will either uh, assist them in climbing, or, or really, at the end of the day, it's uh, it's really it's, it's about climbing, so it doesn't assist them as much as training hard. You know. Sure. Justin up here, still looking so strong, yeah. getting the new high point with authority, nearing yeah. the top now. Yeah, so in Justin's case, I believe he his visual field, like if he looks kind of straight at you, he can't. He has difficulty seeing stuff that's directly in front of him. So it, I think he has more visual acuity in the fringes of his field than, than in the direct center of it. Um, well, he's certainly putting all of it to use right now, looking still so confident, not seeming to be pumped at all, very close to the anchor, looking to negotiate this. Looks like somewhat of a awkward high step here into a tough position. If he gets on top of this, this whole crowd is silently rooting for him. Oh, and he loses the foot. Despite that confidence and composure, still the foot goes. An excellent attempt by Justin Salas. Great high point. Oh, Elliot looks so good, so strong there. We have been casually mentioning, you know, some some information we we ha some medical diagnosis information we have of our paraclimbers, and I just wanted to take a moment to note that this information they provided for us to be able to share publicly. Um, and typically, oh, good job, Elliot! Great, great, great effort. Um, Next on the onto the field will be Diego Kusnir, men's B3, and Stephanie Zaya, women's RP1. And here they come, being welcomed by the crowd. And briefly, before they begin, I will reiterate this later, but the second session was originally scheduled to begin at 2.30, and there has been a change. The second session will actually begin at 3 o'clock. So if you are here with us now and planning for the second session, keep that in mind. The second session will begin at 3 o'clock, which I will revisit again later, but just wanted to get that out there now. For now, our climbers are getting started. The left side, Diego. So Diego is uh, also from from California, uh, from the Bay Area, and he's been climbing at Touchstone. And, and as I mentioned, again, uh, you know, getting gym support, the word, the word, our athletes being able to train and compete um, is, is quite important. He's only been climbing for five and a half months, um, and you're gonna see that it's quite impressive the progress he's made with the support that he's gotten from having an adaptive community in his gym. 
Um, he's very proud of how he did yesterday, and, and we're all rooting for him. Um, and he's really looking forward to, to hopefully going to Salt Lake City for the World Cup. Um, uh, he, uh, I asked him what was his favorite thing about climbing, and he, he said without any hesitation, um, he really likes to push his boundaries. Um, and you can really see that for someone that's only been climbing for five and a half months. Like it's, it's when you start, you know, it's it's when you are the most surprised at how quickly it, it becomes, um, you know, something natural to to climb on walls. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe that he's only been climbing for, you say, five and a half months. He does not look like someone who's been climbing only five and a half months. Uh, that It took me years to, to move with, with comfort and poise and proper body positioning, and he just doesn't. It's cool. I don't know. I don't get it. He doesn't look like a new climber. Some people got it, you know. And uh, to plug in his... Uh his uh, caller uh, is Tina uh, from his gym as well, and she she was gracious enough to travel out uh, with him to to compete, and that is quite quite an obstacle considering how expensive flights have become suddenly. Yeah. <laughs> Over on RP one on the right, we have Stephanie Zaya. She's a uh, from Georgia, well, I guess originally from Boston, relocated to, to Ackworth, Georgia. Um, and she's been climbing with Catalyst Sports out of there. Um, actually got introduced to climbing via an outdoor climb climbing event that Catalyst put on. <laughs> and she just got hooked into it. So, uh, like, I guess a lot of us can, can relate to. Um, and decided hey why not why not try the the competition thing and here she is she's pretty I'm pretty excited all weekend just to be here her first first event and um you know right into finals it's you mentioned she she got hooked to you on an outdoor trip that's how it can go i remember i was 19 years old i went one time i was doing a lot of different sports different activities wakeboarding went climbing one time setting up a top rope in maryland uh climbing in my sneakers no climbing shoes, was convinced that I did not require climbing shoes. It was over immediately. It was the only thing I ever wanted to do, ever. So and that's every discipline, every, I don't know, everybody in climbing can understand that. Like you tried it, what it, what was it about climbing? Couldn't tell you, but as all, you do it once and that's it. That's what you're doing. Yeah. What is it about climbing? It, it's there's something. Something. <laughs> certainly, yeah. Certainly something. A bunch um, of things. But I think. You can see a nice interesting rest she's got there. She's able to kind of drop a leg on top of that that geofin hold. Yeah. Sit on like it for a little bit. Yeah, I can't tell if it's a deep drop knee or if it's the outside of her hip that she's got on it, but looking to rest up while she negotiates this sort of turn around this volume that she's on. Yeah. Left side, Diego methodically making his way up. You'll notice that like our, our RP climbers have just a very different range of wow well incredible just, finger strength on the right side from stephanie yeah just all of our rp climbers just have like a very just a hot, incredible range of, of difficulties that they're dealing with challenges and all of them just learn their own bodies and ways to ways to utilize their bodies um it's incredible and those who are not familiar, RP is short for range and power. And that, that category is, is kind of a, a description that says, you know, hey, some, some climbers may have uh, some deficits in, in the amount of power they can generate <laughs> over one limb or multiple limbs, um, uh, different parts of the body, or deficits in, in mobility and range of, 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 a, of a limb or multiple limbs or, you know something to that effect and some combination of the two often yeah, of those things and yeah it doesn't have to be one thing yeah and it's a, a pretty tough challenge for our our um uh, 
medical team to kind of sort through all of that and determine who belongs in what categories. It's it's a it's a pretty a pretty daunting task for them, and you know, really grateful that we have a team that can show up here, volunteer their time, to look through our athletes, and uh, and make those determinations and make those hard decisions. Um, sometimes emotional decisions for, for our athletes um, to help this competition go on. Yeah, of course. It's something I mention quite often uh, on, on the mic live in-house uh, is to thank the volunteer staff behind USA Climbing. There, there are many levels of it from uh, at the most elementary level, it would be like someone that's a brusher in a bouldering round all the way up to people at the very top of the organization that are like really like doing hard work to make the thing run and they go to all the national level events the the volunteer culture um throughout usa climbing um at paraclimbing and every other event is extraordinary to me um people putting in putting in a lot of their own time uh and, and travel to to show up and make these things operate so much love. That's the short version. Much love to the volunteers. Hmm. Next out here, men's B3, we've got Connor Geary. And on the right side, women's RP1, it's on Hua. Okay. So Connor's a, a long time climber as well. I, I think he's been climbing since, I was talking to his dad a little bit beforehand, he's been climbing since he was five years old. So he's been involved in the climbing and climbing comp competition scene for, for a very long time. Um, both, I believe, in the in our power climbing programs and before that just as part of the, the youth youth programming um, they they spend time in in dallas but also in calgary canada um, his father wayne is actually his caller and wayne uh, talk about being someone who's involved in the the volunteer side he's helped with the uh, usa climbing for a long time as um like part of our medical staff here and um I'm part of the USA Cl Power Climbing Committee um, kind of task force. And okay. he's, I think he's in head of uh, power climbing up in Canada now. Okay. You have some motivated people to keep this sport and the organization rolling smoothly. It, it's yeah. an amazing thing. I've met a lot of them. They're like organizational powerhouses, uh, which is something I appreciate. I'm, that's my weakest link for sure. Uh, and, and to witness people that keep the wheels on this thing, uh, event after event is awesome. And on the right, we have An Hua, and she is uh, she's part of ACG Chicago, and um, she's only been climbing for eight months. And I, even as as not long ago as January, I spoke with her and. And she sh sent me some footage of her climbing. And I can tell you right now that she's made tremendous progress. Um, and again, a testament to, you know, adaptive communities and gyms because they have been able to provide tremendous support and uh, uh, training for her to be able to to get to where she is today. Uh, so just in those like last three months, she has been working tirelessly to make it here today, to know that she can compete um, and to compete at the level that she is at right now. Um, she's really excited to see the progress that she's been making in climbing. That is her favorite aspect. And she's loved how climbing is, has been so welcoming and so encouraging for her to you know, keep showing up, keep pushing, and keep redefining what's possible. Um, it's her first competition. Um, and uh, yeah, she's, uh, she's exceeded her personal expectations. Excellent attempt by Connor on the left side. And I love hearing the details about On. It's her first competition. Th those are exciting times. She's got a whole crowd behind her right now. Fighting to get to, get to the top of the route. First time competitor. Newer climber.
Ons now negotiated that first corner turn around that, that volume, which is exciting to see. Now we got the close up. Looking to gain this next right hand, it looks like. Andrew, do you wanna? Do you have anything you could say about how? What is the route setting like at a para national comp? <laughs> Loaded question. I, I think, you know, my experience route setting and and what these guys are doing now as a team, you know, worlds apart. Right? Uh, when when we were first putting on those first competitions. Um, we were still learning a lot, and we were not as sophisticated as as the teams out here now. I mean, the the, the in the nine nine years since we started, and and the additional work that they put in, all the like training camps and stuff like that, they've 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 learned a lot about how they can challenge the athletes and how they can push them. And the athletes have learned a lot about how how they can use their own bodies. I mean, uh, so it, it's it's pretty pretty different than um from what I first started uh, working in this in this venue. Um, but it, it's certainly a lot of work from the route setters and just you know, just learning about the different disabilities, um, what, what athletes are capable of, what type of holds they can use and what kind of holds they can use but don't know they can use yet. Which yes, is, of course. Which is a really Still creative one. Um, and when we first started trying to figure this out, I said, oh, don't use these kind of holds for this kind of amputee or don't use this kind of movement for this kind of amputee and and I'm watching route setting over the last couple of years and a lot of that's gone by the wayside because <clears throat> our athletes have learned to do those things where they just didn't think it was possible before um, and I think that's a joint effort from the athletes and just really creative route setters who are continuing to push those athletes um, and that's a great relationship I think it's a uh, it's common that uh, the older a sport is, or the longer it's been around, you see each generation of competitors get stronger. Things that were impossible even just 10 years ago are now commonplace. And we see that now in paraclimbing as well, where when the, the program began, uh, there was things that you, the, the competitors weren't able to do and the setters didn't think they could do. And now those things that, those, that happens, like everyone levels up. On here, for example, really delivering. Oh. And it pumps out eventually. You know, speaking to that growth, um, I think that what's, you know, if you ask any of our paraclimbers, they're all, always going to respond, what is their favorite part about competition? And they're going to say community. And, and what that really means is, like, we're here for to compete against ourselves, and we are enjoying the community that we're in. And you guys have mentioned the evolution of, of Paracopy, how, how, you know, the bar has been raised over and over and over on what is possible or, or what is needed. And, you know, it goes to show that, like, we are here to compete against our own expectations of ourselves and to push our own boundaries. And we thrive and are inspired by each other to push harder and to push further and to, to you know, steal some of each other's beta on, on it. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I'm curious to, to see where uh, where paraclimbing ends up. You know, yeah, in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. It, well, you got to steal the beta first of all. That's why. It, that's me. You're sessioning with the friends. You want to hold back for a second. This is me. Let them figure it out. Spend the time. Be patient, and then steal the beta. I guess that doesn't really work as well in a competitive setting. It's just a little yeah. tidbit. It's my bio. Steal yeah. the beta from your friends. Beta shark. Yeah, and I no think doubt. from the route setting perspective, it's it's exactly been that too. Like, a huge shout out to Mark Mercer, who was on that original paraclimbing committee, kind of as, as a route setting voice, and spent a lot of time working with athletes to try to develop knowledge based on on how different athletes with different challenges move, and and experimenting with different ways that we can continue to challenge those athletes, and then helping to teach other route setters what he learned I and mean, then right. spread that knowledge yeah and you know it's it's been a big step up for us um, as a from a, as a competition just getting started on the wall right now we've got Ravina Ali that's women's B1 back to B1 for the ladies now 
And on the right side, it's women's RP1, Christina Lethman. Ravina, also another longtime competitor for, competitor with us. She started in, in our early events as a youth competitor um, with Catalyst Sports down in Atlanta, uh, I believe is where she started. And she's been climbing for quite some time. Um, <clears throat> she, I think this is her fourth national, so I think she competed in in one or two in Atlanta, and then maybe one in Ohio, and now here. Um, and her caller is Fernando, and Fernando has been, been calling since the very beginning, really, you know, 10 years of calling experience, and he's been one of the guys in the U.S. who's spent a ton of time trying to learn a lot about, about this just sport and as a caller and devoting a lot of his personal time to you know, corresponding with the, the Japanese team, as I mentioned previously, to learn some of their techniques and build on the knowledge that they built over there in, in a program that is world class and helping to try to spread as much of that as possible to other callers um, in the country. I love hearing about the, the sharing of this kind of knowledge between not just between competitors domestically, but you also, you, the Japanese teams have figured this out and they've been doing well, then to, to, for them to share their knowledge internationally is for, so that like the whole world globally, the whole thing is rising at the same time. And on the right, we have Christina Lefman. She, uh, she's been climbing for six years, but she hasn't been competing for long. And, and part of that is, you know, it, the, the, the many obstacles that, that exist uh, not making it fully accessible for, for many paraclimbers to come to nationals, but we were able to, to bring her this year. Um, she is fantastic. She worked very, very hard to be here as well, trained very hard, never missed a climbing day, um, and is coming from PCH Bay Area. Um, and as, as you may have seen, um, her primary disability uh, that, that brings her to RP1 is her ataxia. Um, and uh, what that means is, is you know, like it, it's a loss of coordination and, and being able to like fully uh, direct your limbs to where you need to place them or hold them. Um, but uh, it does not affect muscle strength, especially in, in her case. And, and she just, she can hold on, you know, and, and fight through it. And so you see how many RP climbers, they may climb slower, but, but they get there and they get there. Um, you know, in a, in a very impressive way. Yeah, through sheer grit and determination, really just yeah. fighting. I, I witnessed it last year at, at my first uh, paraclimbing nationals where I was on the live stream then. And uh, in the RP category, you can see that it can take some time to make contact with the hold. But the vice grip that happens once contact is made, if, many times we're like, wow, that... That's not coming off. Uh, and, and I've also learned, is, like you mentioned before, that there is, there is a broad range of what range and power means. Um, so those challenges, despite being in the same category, uh, different for every climber in, in whether it's a coordination or a power. Um, but the part that matters and is exciting to watch is watching them adapt, watching the climbing itself, um, and cheering for them as they get up. Hopefully we can see a top over here. Ravina trying to figure out how to get around this volume. On the women's B1. Huge fight by Christina Lefman on the right side. It's oh, and Ravina as well. It's all I can do to not shout out in support. Is what I'm used to, uh, despite the fact that it's not the role we're playing right now. Again, the venue is quiet so that our B1, 2, and 3 competitors can hear their callers. But mm, 
I'm sure many people in this venue share it. It's hard to hold it in sometimes. Next out for women's B2 is Mandy Curtis. On the right side, women's RP1 is Hannah Zook. Nice. nice. Mandy, Mandy's been climbing for several years, uh, six years. She's based out of Boston, um, part of that CRG team up there. A lot of, again, we talk about gym partners, stuff like that. You know, CRG has been a great partner for, for that team up there, Cent uh, Central Rock Gym, and providing support for them and they've had a great program up there and Mandy's been a part of it since I think pretty much day one um, so we've seen her you know compete at the national and international level for the US she's part of training camps that we've done up there to help prepare for for international competitions for sure um, part of her pre-comp rituals to get her hair dyed differently for every single competition so it's kind of her we, it looks like we're going with red today. And, uh, her. I can see it. I can see it. It's like you feel good. You do something special. I guess it's in every sport. Everyone's got their things, pre-competition pre rituals that they go through. And can't say that they don't work. Okay. Excited to see them put it to use here. Okay. Hannah already started on the right side. Just taking off. No time. No time to hang out, huh? Yeah, quickly navigating that first volume, which is now to her left. Promising start for Hannah. Mandy setting off as well. Yeah. Yeah. So little Mandy, Mandy's was illegally blind since since her birth and um she's been working with her caller caller Laura for just about 3 months so not not a super long relationship but um certainly looks like they're working pretty well together in this in this lower section Hannah was present at the last Paranationals in Salt Lake City uh, in 2021, and I, I remember watching her climb, and she is doing very well. Uh, she's definitely You can definitely see the improvement that she's made over the last year, um, and I'm excited to see, to see how it goes. Both of our climbers here are taking their time to work out the beta before they just charge ahead, making sure that, you know, it's obvious. You're trying to get as high on the route as you can. If you get hung up for a second, taking the time to make sure that your plan is working out. It matters. Navigating around these boulders for bee climbers um, gives some added added challenge to the situation as they try to, you know, find and use the holds most effectively. Big fight from Hannah Zook. Now holding it down alone is Mandy Curtis. Looking to find her way across this traverse.
At least her red hair looks really good on the walls. Sure does. It's undeniable. Mandy taking the time to figure this out. Yeah, it looks like she may want to get that right foot up underneath her, but we will see. There she goes, finds the right foot with the small drop knee, gains the right hand. Mandy taking advantage of that shake before she proceeds. The wall's just starting to kick back a little more in this section. So. Still looking pretty relaxed. Yeah, you, you can't quite tell at home, uh, but this entire next panel, uh, the next three tufas, those big yellow ones are all in a quite overhanging piece to the wall. Although our climbers are quite used to it, between the camera angle and the fact that they don't seem to mind, it can be hard to tell. You can imagine just like that pump clock ticking while you're just waiting for instructions, trying oh. to, trying to oh, manage yeah. that. and Totally different kind of endurance, I can imagine. And at this point, it's pretty hard for a call or two because you're pretty high up and you can't really see what holds your climbers are dealing with. Of course. Um, well, an excellent effort. Mandy Curtis. Next out for women's B2, it looks like Coming into the finals, qualified in the first place, it'll be Amelie LeCrout. And then women's RP1, also coming in, qualifying in the first place position, we've got Melissa Ruiz. So Melissa is coming from ACG New York, and she has been competing for four years. Um, she lives in the Bronx, and um, I've known her from the first day she's tried climbing. I, I saw her walk into the gym right in front of me, and I was like, oh, I have to tell this girl that paraclimbing exists, you know? And she just wanted to walk into a gym, just try climbing, you know? Um, and so, uh, you know, at the time, um, ACG was was the primary uh, nonprofit in New York. And so we got her into ACG. Karima has been a great, done a great job of supporting her. And and uh, ACG New York has also given her a lot of uh, help in getting her trained for this. Um, the trainer that they have, the coach that they, they brought with them to comp, um, and that has been working very much with them is, is Philip. And he is a USAC coach uh, also in, in the youth competitor leagues. And he, he works at Vital in uh in Greenpoint and uh yeah quick start for Melissa she's she's doing a fantastic job just breezing through that and you can see you can see like uh the the effect that that training has had on her and then on the left we have Emmeline she is um she is also from New York but she's she's joining from from Paracliff Hangers um she's only been climbing for six months um and at first she wasn't she wasn't sure if she was going to compete she just wanted to enjoy climbing uh unlike so many of our other competitors she doesn't come from adaptive sports um so you know just the idea of doing something athletic was, was something that she didn't think was was an option um 
And uh, you can see she's, she's obviously a natural. She's just breezing through it. Um, and since January, she really beefed up the training. And a lot of that has to do with her caller, um, Alana. Alana has worked in the gym, uh, in gyms uh, in the past and has trained and really took the role as caller very seriously and really worked with Emmeline to really focus and, and get, uh, you know, get climbing techniques dialed in so that she can come and compete so, so efficiently. Um, and a little about Alana, uh, you know, we, we were talking about how climbing takes over your life, but it's also amazing to see all these initiatives done in the climbing community. And Alana, her caller, um, is, is a co-founder for the nonprofit New York City Climbing Coalition. Um, and they work to bring diversity and inclusion um, to make climbing more diverse and more inclusive. Um, yeah. Uh, And Melissa just crushing her way up. Always impressive watching these girls climb. Yeah, absolutely. Melissa taking advantage. Little rest here. That large hold before she proceeds. Nice. Yep. That's very nice. Tossing the entire leg over that that large hold there. Yeah. That? So we've we've mentioned it a couple of times already, like there are a number of athletes who have only been climbing for for short periods of time, relatively speaking. And I think one of the things we always try to do is encourage folks to come out to this competition, even if they don't have much um, climbing experience or competitive climbing experience, because um, this is one of the, I mean, it's the biggest, not one of these, the biggest gathering of adaptive climbing athletes in the country. So even if competition isn't really your thing and you're, you're, maybe you're new, um, it gives us an opportunity to meet other adaptive climbers and to build that community across, you know, across the nation. So maybe you're in New York, which happens to be a very, um, very well populated area for adaptive climbers. We've got some really good programs and a lot of adaptive climbers. But even then, you might only see, meet one or two folks who have challenges that are very similar to yours, whereas you can come here and, and be in a category with five or six other women, five or six other men who, who have those same challenges that you have, and you get to share those experiences and learn and, and um, soak in all the things that are possible that maybe you just haven't seen yet. Um, so it, it's great to see that some of our less experienced competitors are, are still taking the leap to come out here and be a part of the community and and so can what the and share what they they're learning from each other and hopefully in five years they'll be the ones doing you know the veteran stuff sharing to newer of course uh, newer competitors Melissa here fighting her way up she's high up the wall You know, I think it's the high point. I can't say for sure, but that's that's how it feels right now. Melissa doing so well, showing no signs of stopping. Come on now. Uh -huh. What I come to expect when I when I watch Melissa climb over the years is like, it's ain't no quitting. Nope, and always a great performance. Always great effort. Oh, she's fighting it, fo fighting for it now. Excellent effort by Emmeline on the left side as she came down. And that's it for Melissa as well.
coming into finals, qualified in the first place position, really showing us why on that last route of the day. That closes things out for RP1. We have two more competitors, women's B3. Next out, it's Paige Trotter. And Paige is coming out here first, right? Awesome. Yeah, that's Paige right now. Okay. And Paige is also part of the ACG Chicago team. A sh strong, strong showing from the ACG team as usual. And that, that ACG Chicago team is a really tight-knit bunch. They, they're always psyched. Um, and they always have a really good showing in their, in their regular clinics throughout, throughout the month. Um, so I think Paige has only been climbing for a few years herself, two, two and a half years. And this is her second time, uh, her second competition. So still relatively new to the scene, but. Right. I was thinking about, um, you said there are people here who maybe you feel like com high end competition is not your thing. Maybe you're kind of new, um, but the value of being here goes beyond simply the competitive element uh, in that the community element is huge. So what I'm hearing when you say that is to all of our paraclimbers at home that are not here right now, come on. You should Absolutely. be here. You should be here. Next year, like sign you think up. you're not ready, you're ready. Yeah. Come. That's what I'm hearing. You're ready to compete. You're ready to push yourself to, you're ready to experience something new. Experience ready to meet it. some new Have people. Good time. Yeah. Yeah. Feel that vibe. Yeah. yeah. Don't get me wrong. The, the, the right to compete and represent the U.S. as part of the U.S. team in international competition, we should take that seriously. Absolutely. And, sure. and as athletes, um, when we strive for that, that just makes us all better um, from just like our personal standpoint, but also our community, because then we can be the ones who are, you know, helping to push our community forward and in the forefront and the cutting edge. Um, so, so we want our athletes to be focused on, on doing that well, but the other component of, of being the person who's who's just here and being part of the community and partaking and um, that's important too. Yeah, um, absolutely. I love seeing both sides. You have people that have been com competing for 20 years, absolute bone crushers, and it's clear to watch them. And then we have some competitors, um, brand new, haven't been in the game that long, and they're and coming here and getting into this world of of competitive climbing and paraclimbing and love seeing it. I think something that happens often is that a paraclimber will come to nationals, you know, the first time not necessarily being physically ready, maybe not being mentally ready to be a competitive athlete. And then, you know, there's a, such an addictive energy here um, uh, and so much spirit and you just get so motivated and inspired by, by your fellow paraclimbers that you go home and then you just become a crusher and then, you know, may, maybe next year, maybe the following year, maybe like five years later, you are now representing USA's climbing on a world level and, and really showing and redefining what are, you know, your own physical limitations. I love it. So be, being here is, can be the catalyst for like, maybe I wasn't ready the first time. Now I went one time. Tell you what, next year, I'm coming in hot. Let's do it for real. Yeah. Paige here looking strong. And ultimately, even if it doesn't turn into that for you, like the opportunity to be among your peers and among a wider group, I think is, is super powerful. Like that's something that we as climbers always talk about. The community is, is second to none. Um, and same thing goes true for all the power climbers, being part of the climber community and just being have, having more peers in the power climbing community um, just to bond with. It seems um, like in, that in whatever capacity you want to be involved, there's a place for you. Yeah, for sure. Paige mm -hmm. Trotter here in the zone. Yeah, she got through that that traverse section that was giving some other girls some some problems in the other categories with pretty yeah. easily. Yeah, did not seem to slow her down. 
No doubt right now, gathering information from her caller. Our crowd can't help but cheer for her. She makes her way <laughs> towards this next section, this overhanging panel of the wall, guarded by these large yellow toothless. And Paige Trotter is down after an excellent effort. Which brings us to our last competitor of the first session. That's going to be Amy Mullins, women's B3. Taking it home. Amy Mullins, also a longtime competitor. Um, she's accompanied here by her dad, Bob Mullins, as her caller. Amy's com been competing since Atlanta, you know, one of our first nationals, I believe. She may have missed one in between, so um, at some point, I don't remember which one, but um, she's been competing since very early as within the youth category. And then when she actually moved into the adult category, she initially competed as an RP, um, range of power, because she's got a lot of different challenges going on for her. And so in addition to having some visual impairment, she has some other range and power considerations as well. Um, ultimately, I think they've decided to, s they've settled into competing in, in um, the B category, B3, as opposed to competing in the, in the RP categories. And I, I'm not sure exactly how is that working in classification now. I, I was previously it was if you had, you know, qualifications for multiple categories, you can kind of just choose which one you wanted to be in. I don't know if any you have any experience on that. I am not entirely sure um, which one. I would, I would assume that uh, it's still in the case where if you have disabilities. In multiple different categories, um, at the end of the day, you you have to choose which category you will be evaluated on and placed in. Um, so that that is the one thing about the classification system right now is that uh, you know many people experience you know a complex array of, of disabilities, and and at the end of the day, when it comes to competitive sports, it, uh, especially parrot climbing, right now where where the classification is is that it has to be based on one instead of compounding them together. Um, so great, great, uh, great effort by Amy here. She navigated through through those volumes without any effort. Yeah, Amy moving very well right now, keeping a good pace. I think this is when you start seeing what a veteran in paraclimbing it looks like for someone that is relatively new where you know, we, we saw so many strong competitors and and it, it is just their inexperience that at the end of the day, uh, you know, kind of broke them from, from it, uh, you know, set them apart from these these veterans, you know? Yeah, there, there's, no, there's no real substitute for experience. The route reading, um, understanding how to manage the pump, when to rest, how long to rest for, and when to punch it and really move quickly. There's, in competition, you see just, just the ability to not doubt in the moment. There's, you'll see a lot of high-risk moves, or not risk in terms of danger, but risk in terms of popping off the wall. Um, and capable climbers negotiate those situations very quickly. They don't tend to get hung up for very long. Um, and it's just awesome to see it in action. Amy right now is really moving well and keeping that good pace. Yeah. Now into the steep panel of the wall, approaching these two of us. Oh. That's a great little rest by Amy. A yeah, seasoned competitor, promising. but also just a fan favorite year in year out because Amy always tries hard. Like. Um, if she doesn't come screaming off this wall at some point, whenever that is, whether it's a top <laughs> screening from just the joy and excitement or just try hard if she falls earlier, um, I would be surprised. 
Either way, we will see rooting for her here. The feet look a little tricky here. She works her way into that left tufa. Looks like she's got a few options. She could move left. That's yeah. what she's going to do. Oh, yeah. Fights through. Oh, yeah. So on that tufa, you can see there's some tick marks there, and there's a couple of screw and jibs on it. Um, would be pretty hard to see for the caller down below. Um, but they've got onto him. Amy stays on, makes her way through with the left drop knee. And makes her way out of the steepest section of the wall. Now back into a lower angle, looking for that top. Aside from Justin in men's B2, I don't know if anybody's gotten this high, right? I think you're right. I think you are correct on that. Makes it an exciting moment. Our whole crowd watching with bated breath. Of course, as it's been the whole time, can't quite cheer her on the way you want to because she's got to hear that caller. So, I know you guys can't feel on the live stream, but there's a lot of tension here. There's tension. <laughs> just, just Amy Mullins making her way up, trying to find that foot. Oh. And she's out. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Amy Mullins coming in the women's B3, qualifying the first place position, and that closes us out for session one. Like I said earlier, session two is going to resume, resume at 3 o'clock. I think there will be a change of pace here in the booth, but I want to give a big thank you to Danny Kowska, Andrew Chow. Thank you so much for joining me and to the two of you. And uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, it's been awesome. All right. Well, everyone at home, we'll see you back here at 3 o'clock. Go grab yourself some food. See you soon.